start the recording. And then I'll hand over to Erika. Thank you all for being here and a um, special thanks for the Red Wheelbarrow to make it possible because the book has been out in print since June 2020 when it was still pretty much in hard lockdown. So it is very nice to actually see uh, people now and to actually really celebrate it. Um, and particularly to Jacques who actually sent out emails and actually got quite a lot of the organization to put this all together. Um, so thank you very, very much. Um, I, would, I would think of this as maybe, so it is called Selected Mujaji Poems, but I would think of it as a celebration of Mujaji rather than saying the best poems, because I did, uh, in, the, in the reading, there's also, so you read so many poems also again and again, and they become, so what I've tried to do is to put them kind of in a conversation with each other. So some of the poems were more selected because of that kind of echoes between poems. Um, so all in all, I would just like to, like us, those of us who could be here, can be here today to, to, to read some poems. I think they're basically yeah, read two poems. If they're about a one page, if they're more than one page, maybe just one poem. But I think most of the poems in the co collection is um, just about a poem. There's one page, but there are there are some of the longer poems um, as well. So, and I would also like um, to, to thank Monique specifically because she worked very, there was such a lot of putting together and getting, um, details in the layout who particularly worked um, in, in making this a, a beautiful um, and very readable book. I think when one opens it, it has this feeling of there wants to be read. So, Thank you very much. Um, what I would like to do, just simply to keep it simple, is, is, is shall we just simply read by um, alphabetically by, na by name? So then we'd start with Annette Snickers. Is that, is that is fine? Thank you. You'll have to just unmute yourself, Annette. Thanks. I'll start with a poem that I think everybody knows by now. Um, hoping you're bored by it already. It's called Clipped. On those days, I ran about the garden like a wild foal. My father was convinced that little devils nested in my mane. White sheet draped over small shoulders. I was made to sit so he could snip to exercise the strikes, he whispered in my ears. I emerged bobbed, cut straight, in step. And, and a poem that I think uh, connects with um, the feeling of, of a girl feeling helpless. Um, this is now a woman. Uh, quite upset about many things, especially I might just mention here the, the lack of freedom for us to walk in safety. It's called for a change. My anger is too much a lady. She does not shout. She sits in the corner and sobs. I want to shake her. I want to drag her out, bring her into the light. I want her to pummel her fists on the table, make a noise. I want her to wear lipstick, the color of ripe plums and dark roses. I want her to wear heels and stamp her feet. I want her to be a bitch, but she will not oblige. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I see somebody asked if we can have, uh, if, if, we, if you would read the page numbers so that people who do have the book can read the, uh, for, the, for the next people who read when you read, if you read, we'll say the page numbers again. Uh, uh, Uraya Salafranca. Must just unmute yourself, 
Everyone, when you read, please just unmute yourself, if you please. Hi, it's Aria here. Um, sorry, I don't have the book in front of me, so um, I can't tell you the page numbers. I'm just reading from a printout or something else. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is called Steak. <clears throat> There's a perfection in the sharp knife. Handle thick and satisfying to hold. It eases through the meat, parting it like the Red Sea. A thin trail of red juice eases out. I spear the soft buttery steak with mushroom, add a half moon of avocado pear, a quartered tomato. The food shatters in my mouth. There's something about summer nights the kind of nights that follow days in a city that reeks of boiled bodies, crisping under the sun's glare. There's something, the lack of breeze, the water in the pool gleaming bluely, the soft murmur of traffic. It's an island, an oasis, the lawn jeweled green. Candles illuminate our faces, the silver, the sparkling cutlery, the sheer perfection of knife fork, crystal glass. Steak, salad, speared food, shattered tastes. At the bottom of a garden in the heart of Johannesburg. Beyond touch. There are intimacies beyond touch, I am learning. There are intimacies that reach beyond trust. I am trying to remember the lesson as I lean my face into the softness of your smooth neck and feel you pulling back into the responsibilities of your life. So instead we talk about parents, my mother's failing eyesight, and solutions that will appear, even if we have no idea how. Of babies, adoption, hot December nights, a future that mirages into the present. I try to claim them, lay a stake for that future, as I say goodbye, we kiss lightly on the lips. And I'm gone, trying to hold you, hold your words, your thoughts, your face, as the tires slip past, you nesting somewhere in me. Thank you very much. Um, can I ask Crystal Warren to read next? Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, I'm going to start with a poem on page 22 in the book, and it's called Falling. Because I always end up falling, I watch my feet. I walk carefully, wear sensible shoes. I never run. Because I always end up falling, I watch my heart. I try not to care, to tread lightly. I never dance. And then the second poem is on page 252. And it's rituals. I use words to counter chaos. I map the mountains, exploring peaks and valleys, avoiding avalanches. I tell myself stories, leaving pebbles on the path so I can find my way home one word at a time. Thank you, Crystal. Colleen, do you want to read? Um, <gasps> Colleen, is, Colleen was saying that she was not feeling well, so I don't think that she, she, might, she might not want to read. So if she wants to read, I will ask her to send me a message. Um, so um, can uh, Eliza Galgood read next, please? Hi, thanks. Um, it's very nice to be here. And I just want to also thank Jacques for organizing this. Thank you, Jacques. Um, I'll, uh, I'll read two poems. The one is quite personal and the other one is quite political. I'll start with the political poem. It's on page 178. And it kind of weaves the um, Orpheus and Eurydice myth into the, um, um, the TRC, the TRC Commission. The, the sort of idea behind the poems that Orpheus is sent back uh, into the underworld to bring Eurydice back so she can 
um, feature as a witness in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I knew they'd send him to woo me back with his music, his sweet songs, his ardor. He always could inspire love. I hear melodies that linger like the scent of perfume, and I know he's near to return me, to take me home. The bastard, what does he know? Grandson of memory, poets of pastures, of this still place. He thinks we are like the living, only dislocated, condemned to silence, mouths open fish-like without speaking. The breathless ones. Here we have nothing to do but forget. I am drained of memories. They ooze from every wound, leak from any break in skin or bone. I have bled myself dry of him, sweated all caresses, spat out every kiss. I am dismembered. Mourning is beyond me. His music will sew me up like a marionette. I shall caper like a pantomime of my living self to ease some pain that's nothing anymore to do with me. Let the living find their own forgiveness. And then the um, second one is a much more personal poem. Uh, it's also about death. Um, and it's about, um, it was written after the death of my mother. It's called In Memoriam. In the first dream, you're consumed with illness, a caricature, the shadow of a flightless bird, the skeleton of a bird fossilized in stone. In the other, you're in the kitchen, standing by the sink washing dishes. You're wearing your blue nightgown. You're ill, but I am overjoyed to see you. I can feel, even in sleep, the jolts of joy, the unexpected sight of your appearance. In both dreams, you're alive, and I know that I'm dreaming. I know you'll be gone when I awake. I'll lose you once again to the daylight. My waking will kill you. Thank you, that was very beautifully read, thank you. Um, Eliza Kendridge. Hi, I actually didn't really know about this till the I saw it like an hour ago, so I don't have my poems on me, but sorry. I, so I just wanted to join and hear everybody. So, okay. Okay. Hi from oh. London. <laughs> okay. um, Jeannie, thank you. Thank you for joining. Um, hello. Hi. I, yes, I thought I'd have longer <laughs> before, before it was my turn. Uh, this is the longest one I think in the book and Marika chose it so you can blame her um, and I'm also all my books are currently in boxes so I don't have it in front of me I've just got a printout um, but it's called writer's block um, I have writer's block I have writer's block I have writer's block I'm sitting in a coffee shop I got the table with the comfy sofa my coffee is hot because the waiter brought me hot milk, even though I asked for cold. I'm on holiday and I didn't feel like arguing on the first day of my holiday. So I poured in the hot milk. The coffee is bitter. One spoon of sugar has made no difference. I can taste the sugar layered over the bitterness, but it is still there. I revel in it. I have a headache. The coffee is bitter like medicine but I have writer's block. I have writer's block. There are blonde women here. These women are glamorous. I am in a corner at the table with a comfy sofa, sipping coffee with one sugar. 
and my writer's block, and my belly, which shows when I lean back, and my hair, which is silvering. While I sip my bitter coffee, my ex-husband is driving our children and his parents along the coastal road on a journey towards me in this little town. I have writer's block. I have writer's block. Nothing has happened yet to write about. Everything is on a knife's edge of nothing happening while he drives along the coastal road and I wait and sip and wait. The coffee shop sells crafts and arts, kitsch, but I like them. Beside the sofa, four mannequin legs stretch flat-footed, toes at my earlobe, plastered and printed in printed paper, all in the blues. The radio plays music from the 60s. Many people have sat on the sofa before me. My ass slots into the dip they have left. My ass, my comfortable ass with writer's block while I sip bitter coffee. My belly trembles so I suck it in. The blondes have no bellies and no asses, but people with asses have sat on the sofa before, left their mark. The waiter tries to take my plate. I'm staring out the window, fork in my hand. I have eater's block. This is unusual. See belly, see ass. My eyes are not seeing the blown tree or the Coca-Cola umbrellas on the left. They are watching the sea on the left of the car, the traffic on the road, the wind turbines under which my ex-husband is driving with our children and his parents. I reclaim my plate. How much easier to resolve eater's block than writer's block. His parents and my parents have not been together in four years since we split. This visit is a big deal. He is bringing them down the coastal road to my parents' house. I'm not a young woman. I'm not glamorous. I'm not blonde. My belly shows when I lean back. My hair is silvering. I sip a bit of coffee on a knife edge in a coffee shop. Four years since our parents were together. You're so lucky, says Jane. All the artwork is signed Jane. Her eyes are the cobalt blue of the sea. Divorcing and losing family is hard, but you've kept that friendship. Yes, yes, we've worked at it, I tell her. I close my eyes, picture the road, put myself in the car. We've worked hard at it, I tell my ex-husband at the wheel. He turns and smiles. We'll be there soon. I drain the last of my coffee. I embrace my writer's block and my bacon and scrambled eggs. The blondes have all left. Two women hold hands over the other table with comfy sofas. My ex-husband is driving our children and his parents down the coastal road. I am right here, in the dip in the sofa, belly and silver hair, sipping bitter coffee. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> this is completely so enjoyable. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Joan, will you read now, please? I'm also going to read a longish one, um, and it's on page 33. And it's called Flexi Non Frangi. And I realized only after it had been published that the Latin is not correct and my memory was um, faulty. But luckily we've got older brothers, some of us, to remind us of these embarrassments. So it's flecti non frangi supposedly, but I think that what I was thinking of was the English, you know, flex, flexi as in flexible. And what it means is, well, the poem tells, but it means uh, it has this, the connotation of resilience because it's bend, don't break, or to be bent but not broken. For us, like any other fugitive, it is today in which we live. Even then, even in the end, 
you'll never know you've got to the end, disappearing like an old man looking up from the bloody offal of his coughed up lungs. Are you still here? Once there was the long time of now and then, it comes to you as sudden as the swarm itself, sudden swarm through every crevice into the house with the berg wind, hot in the middle of winter or just spring, the cloud of bees detonating against the panes. Season of Boom's lungs and puff adders. Don't ask why this should come to you in perfectly useless concentration widening the vision of happiness, freedom, freeing as the purpose and end. Telos, come like the advent of a child longed for to pour all your love for. Bees breaking free with the scent of Tarkananthus, camphor, bitubuchu, sweet of sorrelia, trace of salt wind dropped to breeze off the sea. Free from, but what to? Not the old freedom of the comrades, comrade. Not any freedom to fight for. No more if you're not for us, you're against us. Arising like the sound of bees, like the coming of a poem, the smell of bees, like sweaty socks under the floorboards. Honey, honey. Wax sweating in the planks in the walls. In the walls, the queen at her regeneration. Workers searching to keep her, making their way in through the cracks. Rust a boy man on the apex of the roof like an Indian god. His straight back strong, limbs wheeling free. Stings thick smoke, smoking out tar, messy down the roof sheets where internal walls are. Where did the swarm swarm to become itself? A vast nest, shelter, sheltering in the wild pear, Dombea, honeybees, come build. Where no one believed, freedom, spirit, scraped out like so much blighted ovum, old molded beeswax. The house burnt now like the ground to the ground. And now only the chimney like in the plantation, the forest there, chimneys, foundations, sometimes still concrete floors. Old ones gone to the city, trekked to another country. The place, the whole hill abandoned. End as in purpose, beginning to see again. Don't throw the tender inception out with the waters of doubt. End as in always, beginning, learning again to free, not into freedom, but freer than before. Not every day, but every day, learning to not restrict one muscle, one body, bending, not breaking, bending from the top of the femur, allowing the spine its length, strength. Remember the old man at home before his last fall, his last, do you think I'll never walk again? Down in the valley, as if it were a decree. You are free, my daughter. And again, as if in benign benison, free. And carved in plain wood on the stoop, plain for all to see, crest of the family, flexi non frangi. All burnt, all gone, all up in flames. Immigrant, fugitive, refugee, old, old story, old as the words you have come to. Old as silence you can't hear yourself think through. Amongst these ashes now, this foreign bird song, these gentle strangers, this old stone.
Thank you, John. Um, Kerry, do you want to read? Are you up next? I'm very happy to read. Um, I'll put my camera on. I can't account for what I look like because I, I wasn't expecting to. Um, but um, And I also don't have the book in front of me, but I'm going to read um, from the section of um, Angels. So if, the, if you've got the book, that's where you can, you can um, look for the poems. So I'm going to read two of my favorite angel poems. The Carrion Angel, rusted sword, knotted hair, blood-soaked feathers. He smells like the end of the world, sulfur and festering sores. He doesn't remember heaven or the fall or why the other angels shun him. He longs to be bloodied, teeth tearing through dead and decaying flesh. His ears are tuned to the whimpers and dying cries of badger, fox, muskrat, owl, the snap of rodent traps. The dream angels. They wait for a blackened moon, then sidle in, infecting dreams with love and lust and flight. I say prayers, but they come back grim-faced, sharpening halberds on swords on stolen grindstones. Their muddy boots mar the kitchen floor. Their blood-gutted kills stinks in pots on the stove. To keep me honeyed, they chant mellifluously as if they were still in heaven. Thanks, Marika. Thank you. Um, I will read from on page 197 in a strange land. A strange as anyone looking for a sprig of green. The city rises, rises here, the country of everywhere, 10 million feet from platform to platform. At four o'clock, the windows shut. I see the walls, I hope. I step out, it's not falling. Every day is a death of first rain and flowers, rows and rows as the guards come on, Count the boots, the coins, the trains rushing by. If the world at hands could have been. The if of life, and I hold it in my mouth, the I, I unreturned. A small stone held in the hand. I cannot keep it myself, but who else? And then on page 270, voice. It slips down your throat, making home inside your chest. You cannot cough it up. It rushes from you when you reach for it. You can only wait. You get up one day and find this rock on it. Your breath seeps out. You cannot move it or step around it. You do not know the weight. Um, and then I'd like to ask Tariru. Hello, everyone. It's good to see you all. Um, I don't think I've seen a single person in this room since before the pandemic, so it's always great to see your faces on Zoom. I'm reading a poem called Fragments. Um, I'm not sure which page it's on because I don't have the physical book with me. Um, and it's an ode to my grandmother, in a way. Pick a color, blue. The color of ocean, of water, of vast expanses, and perhaps escape. Rusape Dam rushing like a blur before the girl's eyes to the place where time stops still. Oh. Pick a color, white. Of white boats, white yachts, and pillowy sails. Of the people who swim there. The glistening of the fishing rod twine where the girl wants to swim, but she is told the river reports secrets. The dam is a crucible of men fish. And time stands still, screams backwards, backwards, until Max, the taxi driver, brings her back to her grandmother's greeting. While we are flesh of my flesh, and everything is as it was before, in the shadow of Tsanzaguru and the lion head Tikwiri. Pick a smell, wet stones, of women hitching their skirts to wade in the river, of perfection soap, greased onto shirts by women freaking speed speaking freely, a dialect so rare it will be ridiculed out of the girl's mouth in later years. Pick a smile then, 
acrid, wet, cattle rushing to kick their feet in the dip, brown, black, mottled, hides and curved horns, an excursion soon to be forgotten, along with the climbing of copies. Pick a smell, acrid, dry, of the library her grandfather left behind that still carries Hemingway and Emicheta. But if Fukutu have eaten the pages, the plots have holes in them now. Bags of fertilizer keep the pages company. Pick a sound, a clang, metal on metal, iron sharpens iron, cowbells on beasts coming home as the orange sun sets. Pick a sound, laughter, two sisters playing skip rope in the dust till their feet are brown and ashy, on their, uh, on their tongues, a borrowed song that never made sense. Christopher Columbus was a great man. He went to America in a saucepan. He went to untie, untie, untie. Into supper by firelight, orange flames and cricket song. Wood smoke has burnished the walls. Remember the girl of those nights where the milky galaxy of bright stars shone, sometimes blue, sometimes bright, and sometimes shooting across the sky. Make a wish, make a wish. Then to gossip and prayers and an hour of Radio One announcements of births and deaths. Pick a sight. Build big silver moon in the inky black night, hanging like low fruit, ripe for the picking. How does the story go? The old Roji kings tried to steal it from the heavens, a legend as ancient as granite, in the, in the shadow of Sanzaburu and Mount Tikwiri. Pick a, sm pick a smell, wet earth, wet grass, early morning dew, cow dung, and clean smoke. Pick a color, pink, frock, Sunday best. Follows her grandmother, her grandmother in Anglican blue, in Anglican white, in swift gait, a surprise baptism. Glacial water on the girl's forehead. Your name is now Teresa Maria Patricia. The girl forgets her new moniker. A particle, dust, gathers on the baptismal certificate, now folded, now carefully placed in the cardboard box labeled envelopes of Chudo, wherein lies the last image of a long dead grandfather, last seen alive in the summer of 76, cause of death unknown. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also, congratulations. I hear you are an edit editor of a new poetry magazine in Zimbabwe, so good luck. Thank you, Malika. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if Helen is, is Helen of, is Helen Moffat maybe? Is she a re are you a re one of our readers? Is, if anybody else is, is here, who maybe under a name that I don't, haven't recognized, if, if you're on this, I think everybody who is here, all of our poets who are here have read as far as I know, but if you haven't, then please wave your hand and read one. Thanks. But, awesome. Thank you very, very much for coming. It is actually, it is wonderful to hear your voices and to see you, see you all as having worked and read all of your poems so much. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody who's read. Bravo. And very smoothly. Well done, Mary Carmen. Smooth processing. <laughs> and normally we do a bit of a QA after our readings. So I'm not too sure if that will work with a, a group session here, but we can certainly give it a try if people are up for it. Um, so if anyone has any questions for any of the poets specifically or for the, the editor, Marika, um, how this anthology came to be, then please feel free to raise your hand or pop a question in the chat. Jacques is our eager beaver. So do you want to start us off, Jacques? So wow, that was wonderful. I I I struggled at the beginning to mute and unmute myself, so I became quiet. But it's been amazing to to hear everybody read. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. 
So, so, so my question is, is for Marika, and it's, I suppose, how, how did the idea for the anthology start? What made you, did, did it happen organically? Did Colleen approach you? Did you wake up one day and decide now is the time? Was it a quiet process? Were there discussions? Were there what sort of a what sort of a journey did you have? Um, so mostly, I think it actually started as a conversation between Colleen and Joan, and then I think uh, Joan. Joan went overseas and also that so anyway so Colleen asked asked me if I would be interested to, to, okay. uh, to work on it and and then also I, I work at Amasvi the South African Literary Museum oh, right. um, so in that sense I had had access to to all the collections of of work so and some and, and then uh, so Colleen and Joan discussed it and then asked me if I approached me to do so to do so and as such I um I put them together I think it was quite a long process I think because they were kind of they're all we all had our had, had I think Mujaji had at some, some stages Mujaji had other things to do and some stages I had things so it, it took quite took quite a while between having decided to do this and the book finally being published but um but I'm very happy for it to have happened like that so wow that's yeah. wonderful that it brought everyone together and and after such a long wait during during lockdown in to be in a liminal space and I hope it I hope it feels properly launched now indeed indeed I think it feels um when it was printed it was printed I think in June 2020 and I literally I think there was that two like two or three days in between when when one could actually buy wine and I didn't but one of my colleagues did and brought me a bottle of wine and I so, so uh, we had work at least sent each other sent some kind of congratulatory messages and I had a glass of wine with my neighbors I live in a flat so so we stood like in five steps from one another and shared a glass of wine so that was at least to know that it was out in print so it's very wonderful to actually then share the launch at least with the, all the poets and poets also involved in it too have that feeling of of it being celebrated together as well. Thank you. Um, Ed, you've got a question. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, that was an amazing reading. Thank you so much for those of you who, who could make it. Um, as First time I've heard many of the voices that previously have only been a name to me. Um, Marika, my, my question is, is for you. I'm sorry, it feels like we're, yeah, but it, it is easier than asking individual poets. Um, your criteria for selection, how, how did you, were there particular um, emotional journeys that, that you wanted to foreground, uh, particular themes? Um, did things suggest themselves? Um, I think it was maybe a bit more of the suggest themselves, but I did go through things and I kind of like and had like a longer list. And then I tried to put, a, and then I made it sort of like an, a medium list. And then I made copies of all those. Okay. And I tried to put them and I physically moved them around. And then from there, I kind of figured out, okay, these kind of belong together. And it felt to me, the, and sometimes I kind of took, okay, but this one now doesn't, but that one might have, might fit better with this conversation that I'm now seeing there. And then I went back and fetched some from the other list. So it was quite a, um, and, and I felt that I couldn't quite do it without seeing each one. So I had to have each poem on its own page so that I could I could sit in a, 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 at the museum there's a reading room which was fortunately not much used during lockdown so I could sit and use all the tables and back them back them all out and um, to kind of arrange and so the arranging also helped with the 
selection. And I, and I quite like that there was quite a nice review in Africa in words where the reviewer specifically talked about how the poems were in conversation with each other, because I, I really hope that it would, um, that that was the, the sense that I, that I wanted from it. Um, I did arrange it kind of like four sections. And then after each section, I put a kind of a long poem or a, a series of poems that was, um, uh, so for example, uh, Kerry's angel poems, I, I kind of saw them as a series instead of individual poems. And then I put them in as a, a kind of that a series, a series of poems to make a kind of a section break between the four different sections that I made. Um, I hope that uh, that that helps. Definitely. I mean, uh, it, it sounds like you enjoyed enjoyed it very much. Um, mm -hmm. and that reflects in, in the book. So thank you, Marika. Do we have any other questions or comments from the audience? Doesn't look like it at this point. Mm. Anything final you'd like to add? Yeah, someone. Well, well coming across as twenty twelve, but we're really an old man and an old maid, <laughs> and Marika's parents. And all I can say is, this was a wonderful experience. Thank you very much to everyone. This was Have absolutely superb. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for being here. Yes, Joan. Sorry, I just wanted to say that that I really do think that um, Marika did a beautiful job and that in a way the, the voices really found a forum and found and it's wonderful to have that sense of them echoing off each other, which I don't think they would have in nearly the same way if we'd just all been in little volumes on our own, you know? So it's great. Thanks, Marika. Thank you. Thank you. And Elisa, Eliza, you also have something? Yes, in fact, I just wanted to echo that sentiment um, to thank Marika very much for putting the anthology together. Um, and again, just to um, thank Colleen for the amazing work that she does for poetry um, in South Africa. You know, I think um, people, you know, people always say that, that nobody buys, buys poetry, although I'm not sure how true that is. Uh, I think they'd buy more of it if, if, if um, there was more exposure to poetry. So um, yeah, I think it's these things that keep, that keep poetry alive. And I think we poets are very, very, very grateful. So. I just want to, to uh, add my thanks. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. Um, I'm curious, so I'll ask a question. Um, did you, or you and Colleen, choose the poems yourselves from the different poets collections or was it uh, asking the poets which poem would you want Chosen. No, I select. I selected. I selected them, and then in the end, we did send the. We did say these are the poems, and that's collected. That's that are going in, and then in in that way, ask the poets if they are happy for it to be republished, and particularly. And then when it was laid out, also whether they still want that particular format. I think that. Um, um, Beverly Rycroft, for example, published a new version of one of the, uh, the slight edits to the poem from the, from the time. And I, um, so the, some of the poems were slightly different from the version that, that was published in the, in the Mujaji, in the, in, the, in the first, since it was published in the, in the collection itself. So we, so, so I selected them and then we uh, asked the poets whether they were kind of like unhappy with the selection. And then uh, the designer also created PDS for each for each poet and sent it to them so that they could see see if they were kind of happy with how it was laid out. Yeah, because it basically had to be. I sent a selection and Mujaji 
had to recreate it digitally to, to, to publish it again. Or, yeah. So, wow, real mammoth, mammoth effort on your part to, to get it to that point. That's amazing. Um, Jacques or Barbara's hand is up. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge Colleen as well um, for, and I hope she's still in the room, for just for the incredible body of work that that has that 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 Mojanchi has put into the world for um, the longest time. I mean, I remember teaching English um, literature, you know, as a as a as a tutor um, about twenty years ago at university, and just the the dearth at the time of. Um, of, of poems to, to choose from by South African women in, in anthologies. Uh, it was, it was, there, there was a dearth, it was a, it, there was a silence. Um, and Mojaji has almost single-handedly changed that. So I just, I just really want to acknowledge Colleen for what she's doing. Yeah. Bravo, here, here indeed. Yes, and thank you for you for what you are doing at Red Wheelbarrow also to make the kind of reading and the joy of it, joy of the reading also. Making conversations, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, in yes. a way, it's just, you you put things to, you know together. You 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 um, make a list of readers. It's a bit like making an anthology. You're looking <laughs> for conversations, and yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll, so we'll, we'll think of you, yeah, absolutely. Anyone else who'd like to add something? Eliza Kentridge is waving her hand. Yeah, <laughs> unmute yourself. Hold on. Oh, you muted yourself again. Okay. Here we go. I wanted to say it's been so nice to be in this group sort of unexpectedly this evening, sitting in my dad's house in London. And that um, I haven't actually written a poem for probably two years and or since the COVID began. And when it began, I had a whole I had a whole new collection of poems that I've been, you know, was trying to get together and then COVID just like made me, I basically put down my pen and picked up a needle and I've been sewing ever since. But, but being in this group has kind of makes me want to get back to it. And um, so thank you very much. It's, I think it will send me back. And the other thing is for to, is it Marika? I haven't met you, but what you were saying about putting everything physically, the printing it out and putting them out on the poems on tables. I think that's what I need to do with my bunch of poems that I'm trying to make into a coherent collection. I need to, I don't know if other people do it, but I, I can't sort of figure it out on the computer. I need to have a whole sea of paper on the floor to try and make sense. So I'm glad, I'm glad you do the same. <laughs> Thank you. But anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much to everyone. And obviously Colleen. And Joan, who was my editor. So yeah. Anyway, thanks. Thank you for that. I think definitely the physical still trumps the computer sometimes for me too. And I'm a young person. Anyone else would like to add anything? Welcome to unmute yourself if I haven't seen you waving at the camera. Otherwise, we will wrap up this section of the evening, but we still have an open mic to follow. So those of you who'd like to stay and share some more poems, um, you're very welcome. We'll take a little break first and then we'll come back for that. So thank you again, Marika. Thank you, Colleen, for being here in the silent background and for all you've done to bring all of these poets together. 
And thank you all of you for showing up and reading your poems. It's been wonderful hearing them. This evening has been recorded. So if you'd like a link to it to share with your friends or family, you're welcome to email us and we'll send it out to you.